John chapter 13, starting at verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he has said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. These first three verses in this chapter are quite an introduction to what is about to happen. When you think about how John could have written this, he could have just said, Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments. He could have started there, but instead he has quite an introduction to what is about to happen here. In verse 1, it says, Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father... Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. John here is connecting the washing of feet with dying on the cross, which is going to happen. This, from this point on in John, is going to set in motion everything that is going to lead up to the cross. And what John is saying is that this act of washing feet is in the same spirit of dying on the cross. They kind of go together if you will. His hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, and he loved them to the end. To the end he loved them. And then verse 2, during supper when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, John goes out of his way to mention someone here, Judas Iscariot, he was there, and Jesus washed his feet. Judas comes up here in verse 2 and then a little later on too. So John is intentionally putting this guy in our minds as we're reading here. Judas was there. While he was washing feet, Judas had his feet washed. And then later when they had supper together, he ate with them. So he goes out of his way to make sure that we know that Judas was there. And then verse 4, it talks about how Jesus took off his outer clothing. You know, it's kind of like you had a a garment and then you had some undergarments. So Jesus takes off just his outer garment and he wraps a towel around his waist. 
That means Jesus is dressing like a slave. This is how slaves were to dress. There was a Roman emperor named Caligula who kind of had, was kind of full of himself and he wanted to humiliate all the senators. So he actually made them dress this way, exactly, so that he could show them who was really in charge. Caligula made the senators dress like this and wait on him. Jesus dresses this way voluntarily to show where he is with us. Verse 5 poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Okay, washing feet. I think many of you know this already, but washing feet was a job beneath even most slaves. There were many slaves out there who would refuse to wash feet. And Jewish law even allowed a slave to refuse to wash feet. This was a job for only Gentile slaves to do. This is, this is a very low job to do. Slaves even had the right to refuse this service. Now why was this so humiliating? Why would people be so averse to washing feet? It doesn't sound very pleasant, but I don't know, it doesn't sound that bad, does it? Well, I mean, first of all, it was dirty. When you're walking around in sandals in a hot, dry, dusty climate, your feet are going to get caked with dust. So it's not going to be very clean. But I can think of things that are more disgusting than, than just some dusty feet. But there's some symbolism here. And again, this is an honor-shame culture. And when you're in an honor-shame culture, maintaining your honor is very important. So, the body has symbols of honor in it. So, for example, your head is the seat of honor. Your head is the seat of honor. When Jesus said, if somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If somebody struck you on the right cheek, that was, means that they were directly insulting your honor. It wasn't an act of violence. It was an attack on your honor. And so Jesus is saying, you know, humble yourself. You don't need to defend that honor. But the head is the part of the body that is anointed with oil if you're going to be anointed as a priest or a king. It's the part of your body where a crown is placed if you are royalty. And in the Bible it says that Christ is the head of the church. This is, this is where the honor is, up here. Down here, this is the least honorable part of the body. This is the part that walks on these dusty dirty roads. This is the part that is the least honorable. When you want to pay somebody special respect, you fall at their feet to show where you stand with them. Many times in the Bible it talks about putting the enemies under your feet, kind of a walking in triumph over them. There's a book, Robinson Crusoe, where there was a guy who owed Robinson Crusoe his life, and they didn't speak the same language, but he takes Robinson Crusoe's foot and he puts it on his head to say, I am in your debt. I am going to serve you. So the head is the honorable part of our body, and the feet are the least honorable part. In fact, doing this right here in many countries of the world would be like me giving you the finger. If you show somebody the bottom of your foot, that is a grave insult to them. Even pointing at somebody with your feet is very insulting. Kind of also gives new meaning to 
that verse in Genesis chapter 3 where God says to the serpent, he will crush your head, you will strike at his heel. Satan is only going to get at the heel of Jesus, but Satan's head is going to be crushed. Okay, so to wash somebody's feet, that means your head goes low and your hands are touching somebody else's feet. You have to bend down, you have to put your honor low, and then your hands have to touch the most dishonorable part of somebody else. Just that action is a very humiliating action. It takes away somebody's honor. And even slaves did not want to lower themselves to that. I mean, slaves didn't have a lot of honor in society, but they had a little bit and they wanted to maintain that. So they're not going to surrender that little bit of honor that they have. Jesus had all kinds of honor as the Son of God, the King of the universe. And he doesn't mind giving it all up and stooping that low that he would even wash somebody's feet. In honor shame cultures, it's about being part of a group. We talked about that before. Group honor was with the group head. So, head of a group. Jesus is the head of the church. This is where our honor is. As a church, Jesus is our honor. And groups of all kinds, they boast about their leaders' accomplishments, their victories, their credentials, territory, and such. And so that's why we give all glory and honor to Christ, our head. We boast in his victories. We glory in our Redeemer. Or as one song says, we fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. So we give him all of our honor and our glory. Because he is the head of the church. But in this world of honor and shame, those in power are entitled to privileges and must look as mighty as possible. This is is what is expected. It was not very common for a leader, an esteemed leader, to stoop low. In fact, it was incredibly rare. It was surprising, in fact, for example, when Alexander the Great would actually walk on foot with his troops. He wouldn't ride a horse. That was unusual. If you're a leader, you want to maintain that status. You want to demonstrate that you are strong, you are powerful, you have victories, you have honor. And in that way, the whole group is honored. This is who our leader is. Look at what he can do or what he has done. In Luke 22, I like the way Jesus puts this here. Who is greater, the one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So he's kind of saying, isn't it obvious who the greater person is? It's the one who's reclining at the table, the one who's being served. But I'm throwing you a curveball here. I'm going to serve you. To have an esteemed master doing the work of a slave was shameful. In a way, the disciples are saying, you are shaming all of us by doing this. Because, you know, our esteemed leader is supposed to be up here and he's our, our pride and joy. You know, we hold them up here. And you're stooping all the way down here. And when you do that, you're bringing us all down. Any nation, for example, at that time, 
If there was any nation who had a king who washed feet like a slave, that king and that nation would be a laughing stock. Oh, you have that king who washes people's feet like a slave. What a loser. I mean, that's, that's what's going on here. Jesus is not just lowering himself. He's lowering all of his disciples, too. At least in terms of the world's version of honor and shame. So Peter, when Jesus comes to Peter, this is what's going on in his head. Lord, do you wash my feet? Really? It's unthinkable that a master would wash feet. He's, it's interesting. He says, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? I'm calling you my Lord. You should be up here. You should not be down here. In fact, the Greek, it's really awkward the way he says it. Lord, you, me, wash feet? It's like he's stuttering almost. It's, it's just incomprehensible to him. Are you really going to do this? Have you no honor? Have you no respect? No self-respect at all? And then verse 8. This is my translation. Absolutely never will you wash my feet in a million years, is how Peter says it. He is very adamant that this is never going to happen. I refuse. And Jesus' answer, I love this, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. This is where we're going as a group. This is where I'm going as your leader. I'm going down. And unless I wash you, you don't belong to the group. But John ties this whole lowering of self, acting like a slave, to the cross at the beginning. Like I said, and in the world's eyes, an esteemed master dying the death of a slave was shameful. So Jesus, in the world's eyes, is incredibly shamed. Not only does he wash feet like a slave, he dies the death of a slave. He, is, he has no esteem, no honor at all. Nobody should follow him. Nobody should pay him any amount of respect or give him any time of day at all. We should all be kicking dirt at him, in terms of the world, anyways. First Corinthians 1 puts it this way, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. This is ridiculous to everybody else. And then a little later on, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. This is just nuts. Who would, who would follow a Lord and a Master like that? That is just unbelievable. And yet, Jesus is seeing this in a whole different way than anybody else is. He's, he's lowering himself like a slave and dying like a slave. And he doesn't see it as shameful at all. A little later on in this chapter, Jesus would speak about his shameful death as glory. In verses 31 and 32, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him... God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. So notice the repeating of the glorifying. This is, this is a glory to die on a cross like a slave. Jesus is seeing something very different. God's grace brings a whole new economy of honor and shame that is foreign to all groups of the world. It doesn't matter where you come from or 
what time do you live in? Jesus brings a whole new notion of what honor is, what respect is, what dignity is. And it, it baffles every worldly group of people. This doesn't make sense. And if we didn't have our eyes opened by the Spirit, we would think it would be ridiculous too. Let's uh, look at the screen here together. What do we do that is good? Only that which arises out of true faith conforms to God's law and is done for His glory, and not that which is based on what we think is right or on established human tradition. Because Jesus brings in a whole new set of what is right and good for us to do. The world and we, we want honor, we want respect, we want dignity, and why not? I mean, we are made in God's image. Why wouldn't we want at least some dignity and respect? But Jesus sees honor, dignity, and respect in this whole different light that does not follow human tradition or what we think is right at all. This is what grace does. When you have the grace of God, it changes everything. It changes the whole notion of honor and shame. Verse 14, Jesus repeats, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So we serve a master who serves like a slave and tells us to follow him. So Jesus is not just lowering himself. He's saying, I want you to lower yourself too, just like me. We're we're all going to do this together. I want you to all... All of you, I want you to wash one another's feet like slaves. Groveling on the ground, right where people's feet walk. I want your honor to be down there. Humble yourself. Just like I'm doing. I'll, I'll demonstrate. Here we go. Jesus is the king of the universe, the son of God, and he's lowering himself to the lowest of slaves. So just, if this is who our master is, this is who we're following. This is who he said, you are our Lord and Savior. And if this is what our Lord and Savior does, then this is what we should be doing too. So there's all kinds of applications for this. But here's just one. There should be no jobs beneath Christians. There should be nothing that we should refuse to do because it's just too humiliating. Romans 12, 16, Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. This is the antithesis to grace and what Christ was. Now, there's jobs and work that is sinful, and then that would be out of bounds, like being, example, a, a hitman for the mob probably is not a good thing to do. But nothing, no line of work, no kind of work should hurt our pride. Nothing should hurt our pride. There's a lot of people out there in our country who won't work because they don't want to take orders from somebody else or they don't want to, you know, flip burgers or something like that. That, That's beneath me. Let's not be that way. Whatever God gives you to do, you do it with all your might and you take pride in it, not because of what it is or because how other people are going to look at you, but because of how your Savior acted. There was no job that was too low for him. None. And so if you do something that is on the humiliating side, or maybe you're a little embarrassed by it, then you are like Christ. You are walking in the footsteps of your Savior. 
So in your work, wherever you work, I know a lot of you work in different places, do different things. I'll throw something out there for you. Why don't you volunteer to do the job, that one job, that nobody else wants to do? You volunteer to do it. When uh, I was working at the grocery store, I remember nobody wanted to clean the bakery. When you, when you went back there, there would be all kinds of flour on the floor. There would be spilled batter of different kinds. I don't even know what it was, but it was, it was just it was nasty. And there'd be all these big bags of flour to dodge and everything, and you had to make that floor spick and span. I always got that job. That was, that was one of my jobs. I remember there was somebody who usually stocked shelves and for some reason he was asked to do it. And I walked by, I wasn't with him or anything, but I was, as, I was, as I was walking by, he was talking about how he was just grumbling on, to himself. like I can't believe I'm doing this. This is, this is not worth my six bucks an hour and all of that. No job is beneath us because Jesus washes feet. And another thing, Jesus washed the feet of Judas. So there is no person we refuse to serve either. I mean, Judas is Jesus's, you know, should be his ultimate enemy. Imagine washing the feet of of somebody like Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein. Can you imagine doing that? This is is what Jesus is doing here when he's washing the feet of Judas and when he's eating with him. And Jesus knew exactly who it was and what he was going to do. It wasn't like this took him by surprise. When Jesus was arrested, he healed the ear of the one arresting him. There's a man named Polycarp. He was one of the uh, people who was taught by the apostles in Smyrna. And he was going to be, he was an old man and he was going to be arrested because he was a Christian. It says, when he heard of their arrival, he went downstairs and talked with them, these people who were going to arrest him. And while those who looked on marveled at his age and steadfastness, and at how there should be such zeal over the arrest of so old a man, straight away, Polycarp ordered food and drink as much as they wished to be set before them at that hour. He fed them. This is what it means to follow Christ. You should do as I have done to you. And an overall point here, is that the world's respect and honor is hollow. Honor comes from God as we serve like Jesus. Jesus made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, the death of slaves. Therefore God has highly exalted him, And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Honor and respect comes from the Lord. No matter what others say. Let's seek that kind of respect and honor. And let's bow our heads. Lord, our God in heaven, Lord, the world has its own version of respect and honor and what it means to hold your head up high. But Lord Jesus, you stooped low and you even washed feet and died the death of a slave. Lord, this is a difficult thing for us to follow, but Lord, please help us to do that. Help us to see these opportunities to take so that, Lord, we can demonstrate 
to others what it means to follow you, what it means to have honor that comes from you. And Lord, so that we can better understand who our Savior is. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.